Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, looks like we're having some difficulties. Um, let's get this. Let's get this moving. Um, all right. So it looks like we're live now. And I'm make sure, because you just never know with technical stuff. <laughs> we're getting in a very technical area and not being very technical. Uh, but I think now we should be okay. I'm going to go on YouTube just to make extra, extra sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, good uh looks it looks it looks like it's going all right cool so anyway very happy to be here super happy to be here and we had we had so much action yesterday that was like you know what we're gonna need to add more time um i appreciate all of you um making the effort to be here and just wanted to say that um while we're doing this because yesterday we had some amazing we had some amazing uh folks in the chat so i, I wanna i just want to say that with the, the things that you're getting from each one of the talks um, feel please, uh, if you, it's, it's better to do a, a Twitter, um, thread because the comments later on, on YouTube disappear. Um, so yeah, woo. Yeah. What's up? Uh, so, Hey, 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 um, very nice to see you in the, in the audience, Sajan. Um, but anyway, uh, like I said, we are, we are live in the second day of DOK Explorer days. And, uh, one of the things that we're going to be starting out with is bringing back mm -hmm. one of our, one of our interns, all right. Who's doing really, really cool stuff in the, in the cognitive ecosystem and has decided what we have two different examples actually mm -hmm. of, of folks who on their own have decided to do different challenges. Um, <clears throat> our first speaker today is a Tarv, who's a musician, a singer, a songwriter, a passionate person with an amazing sense of humor, who once upon a time gave a talk about disaster recovery and disaster recovery and had a, a power outage and had to deal with his own disaster at home and was still able to give his talk in the dark despite not having electricity. I don't know how he was able to make the internet work, but he can do lots of kinds of magic. I thought of whenever you're ready, you can turn on your camera and microphone so we can see and hear you. Um, that would be great. Assuming that you are here and you're not hiding. Good. You're not hiding. What's hey, up, man? How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Super excited to be here. Yeah. Likewise. So I thought, first of all, can you just tell people a little bit about who you are and then we can get into to what you've been working on? Cool. Well, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Atharv. I am an engineering, recent engineering graduate uh, of 2022 from India. And I'm a cloud native enthusiast as well. And I I'll keep a little secret about what I'm doing right now for the presentation ahead. And uh, looking forward to it. Good. And when did you find out about the data on Kubernetes community? I, because it's it seems like it was so long ago, but like at least a year and a half ago, I'd say. Yeah, it has quite been time, uh, almost like one and a half or like probably two years. <laughs> yeah, get it, get it, yeah, yeah, closer to two years, closer, closer to two years. years. So yeah, so you've been, you've been doing lots of cool stuff and you are currently based in Delhi or where are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm right now based in Delhi. Good. And what's the stuff that you have behind you? Can we see? Okay. No, you have, you have stickers? I, I, I have yeah. some stickers. Oh, there's very one good. Emlet sticker. And then very there's nice. one GitHub cat. Then Google developers sticker and a few cool. more MLH stickers over there. All right. So you got a little collection and going on. That's good. Also my guitar. Oh, hey, hey, we may ask you to bring that out later. <laughs> Be careful. Cool. So that being said, tell folks today, if you start sharing your screen um, to let folks know what you're going to be speaking about. Oh, well, sure. So uh, I'll just quickly share my screen and Well, I hope my screen is visible. Sorry, one second. I'm just uh, commenting because we're getting lots of people sharing your favorite emoji. What's your favorite emoji? I thought? Yeah, my ghost emoji. <laughs> yeah. So we got folks in the audience that are already sharing that. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much sure every one of the old and don't might, might be knowing that only people who have been uh, following yeah. me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, any, any, everywhere you go, there's a very happy ghost. And, and I think it's nice that you have that characterized very well. You should get a sticker for that, actually. Anyway, I'll turn off my camera and microphone. You take it away. And, and let's see what folks um, are able to perceive and learn from this presentation. Go for it. Oh, well, cool. Well, so I hope my screen is visible now. Yes, yes it is. Okay. Well, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about the 12 chapters of data on Kubernetes or DOK. And just before we go like this kid uh, and like submerge and ourselves into the uh, DOK world, 
like let's start off with a quick intro of mine so hello everyone uh, i'm athar i'm a former dok devrel intern so i graduated with an engineering degree from india in 2022 and today i'm going to talk about this one small project of mine and in which uh, i'm taking help of none other than our main man bart and for uh, him a uh, quick shout out and like i'll be wearing uh, sunglasses this to look dope <laughs> anyway and this project of mine is called astral chapters of dok and the reason why i started this project was to get a better understanding of the cloud native world more like a deep dive for uh, the cloud native world and for this project well chapters of dok i was going through a book called as managing cloud native uh, data on kubernetes by jeff carpenter and patrick mcfadden my uh, the both are like the true veterans of their field and hence this book well so uh, this is what the book looks like and trust me uh, this kit was honestly my first reaction ever after getting the book and the power of this uh, the power the book carries is just like phenomenal there's a recent dok report 2022 uh about which i'll be talking shortly in the coming slides but before that uh let's learn what this project is about and like i said i wanted to take a deep dive into the kubernetes world so i asked a very dear main man bart the answer uh, uh about uh, this one question and the answer uh, was questions 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 uh sounds ironic but he said remember athar no question is a stupid question and hence this idea of uh, asking a questions not a, just a question but a series of questions and that is what my project is about so uh, basically uh, i went through the few uh, first few chapters of the book uh, and here are few of the questions that i came across while going through the first two chapters of the book and uh, the questions uh, were kind of uh, like not really easy to find answers to or sometimes very easy to find answers to but never mind i still stuck on it uh, stuck on with it cuz like part always says that questions uh, aren't a stupid thing to ask so that is what uh, we are going to stick up to and like learn what are uh, my learnings have been so far about these questions and their answers like so uh, before we jump up with the answers uh, about uh, the different questions i have faced and like uh, like whatever like thoughts i have about it i would like to uh, say uh, thanks to all the explorers and people on the dok slack uh, cuz like they have helped me uh, a lot in finding the questions uh, answers to these questions and also some questions were uh, more surfaced uh, after i got few answers uh previous answers to the earlier questions so that is what it would be like so let's jump into the first question that i encountered so the first question that i encountered was uh, what is a database and uh, what uh, was like uh, uh before the electronic database systems and what is the evolution of database uh, database systems has ever looked like after that so uh, let's try right jump into what a database looks like so a database kind of looks like this uh, like um, we are here talking about supposedly the electronic databases so a database is an organized collection of structured information or data typically stored electronically in a computer system a uh, database is usually controlled by a database management system and together the data and the dbms along with the application that are associated with them are referred to as database systems often shortened to just like the database and data within the most common types of data uh, bases in operation today is typically modeled in rows and columns and in a series of tables to make processing of processing and data querying efficient and the data can be easily accessed managed modified updated controlled or organized uh, and most databases are use uh, are using structured query language that is called as sql uh, for instance if you guys I, I hope uh, everyone of you might be knowing about it but what about uh, before electronic databases because uh, the second question goes around that and like uh, so this is what uh, certainly there was before electronic database systems so we used to have this like sequential storage such as magnetic tapes uh, there were algorithms used for organizing data into these magnetic 
tapes for like fast access times and uh, while we go about the uh, last question around database was uh, what is the evolution of database ever since then so uh, there were various punch card formats that were also popular allowed uh, optimal read and writes and then uh, when we talk about uh, the different different uh, orders uh, or like the transitions databases took so we'll start off uh, with the hierarchical databases so the first generation of database management systems were hierarchical in nature and organized in a tree like structure this approach was used by early database systems such as ibm's uh, information management system that is ims and then uh, in the uh, in the 1970s uh, there was a time of relational databases the development of relational database systems in the 1970s uh, marked a major shift in the database technology these systems were based off the relational model which organizes data in tables and uses a standardized language called as sql to query and manipulate the data the first commercially available relational database was the oracle database and which was released in 1979 and ever after that in the 1980s to 1990s there was object oriented databases and then there was finally the arrival of the uh, 2000 that is the no sql databases in the early 2000 uh, 2000s a new type of database known as uh, new no sql short form of not only sql emerged and these systems were designed to handle large amounts of uh, unstructured and semi structured data and were particularly well suited for web applications and data intense uh, data intensive environments and then finally uh, there was like one arrival of another arrival that was of uh, that was in the 2010s and that was of uh, new sql databases in the uh, 2010s and a new generation of databases known as uh, new sql emerged and these systems combine the scalability and performance of no sql databases with the transactional consistency of trans uh, of the traditional relational databases uh, uh, remember the point i just like said scalability and performance so no wonder when we are talking about both of these terms we are going to go cloud and the present day is cloud databases with the rise of cloud computing uh, many databases are now available in cloud based services which provides easy scalability and accessibility as well as built in backup and disaster recovery capabilities exactly like disaster recovery other goes well aligned <laughs> anyway oh, <yeah>. so <laughs> so uh, let's let's just like jump into the another question um, uh, that i faced uh, probably the last question i'll be talking about today uh, which i went through while working on my project i'm still on it uh, there would be a series of questions ahead and uh, the other question is what does a fully realized kubernetes application looks like well, so uh, before we jump into it, I would quickly like sharing uh, this uh, logo of DOK. And uh, hence, I'll be talking about, I was going through this one uh, DOK research report, uh, 2022. And one of the things that was mentioned in the reports was the issue of maturity and how does an organization uh, gain that so that the applications can be fully realized. But uh, what does a really fully uh, uh, realized Kubernetes application looks like? And before G we j jump on to that, uh, like I found the answer to that was pretty much in our community itself. And the answer to that question lies in the fact that Kubernetes was earlier built for stateless workloads. But there are a lot of practitioners that realize the true value behind running stateful workloads and kids and hence this community was formed and hence the slide. Well, so uh, I'll jump onto uh, another slide that is uh, last thing first. And uh, I asked one of the veterans about this problem. And to me, his answers were uh, his answer was like that. It is important to be cautious uh, when vendors claim that their solutions are production ready. And this is because uh, what works for one production environment may not work for another. And it is important to talk customers and understand their specific needs. Kubernetes is definitely a popular technology for managing containerized applications, but it can be complex at times and difficult to fully understand. However, Kubernetes is flexible, just like us, me, <laughs> and even Bart, and can be customized to meet specific needs. And overall, the paragraph, uh, uh, like which I went through, uh, uh, the author, like or the veteran uh, who wrote me the answer for this question, 
it was kind of suggesting that uh, the importance of understanding the unique needs of each production environment is really really necessary and being cautious while adopting these technologies is very important as well and this is what exactly the insights of dok year uh, 2022 report suggest the first point that the dok 2022 report was saying was the organize was that that the organizations are winning with dok and uh, 2022 DOK report suggests that by running DOK workloads, organizations were able to make big gains in terms of revenue or like productivity. And then comes the second point that like the benefits of DOK are not just limited by the organization, but the tech maturity as well. And of course, like there are a few still challenges that we are yet to uh, get over, but DOK has very bright future. Uh, hopefully just like my future <laughs> and i hope i do have a bright, bright future <laughs> anyway that was a yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, while while we while we sum up this uh quite presentation of mine <laughs> uh, i think that uh, it was enough for today and i really hope uh, you all must have enjoyed and there's a quick uh, lesson for every explorer out there I don't know where this clapping sounds is coming from. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but uh, I hope uh, you all have enjoyed. And the quick lesson about uh, uh, me or like uh, anyone for for the explorer from my side would be: uh, it's never too late. Trust me, it's never too late. And even if we are late, you can still approach the person and do the right things because it's never too late. Just like Bart says, no question is a bad question remember that and stick to it and uh, if uh, by any chance if you were you would have liked my presentation and like want to connect with me uh, here are my socials down below Athar Karizki is my uh, you can find me easily on my LinkedIn and Twitter and that's all from my side see you Excellent job, Atarv. All right, absolutely nailed it. Very concise, very practical, great explanations. And I love the background as well, too, about databases, right? We get, you know, it seems like it was 5,000 years ago. And for young people, it probably feels like 10,000 years ago. But we're talking about things that have developed. It's important to remember those roots. So I really like that you included that. Something that we've said many times, too. The skills that you're that you're that you're using that you're developing, you can use them absolutely anywhere. And for or how to get a rocket to the moon or or anything, it just being the book as a, as a sort of guide, you know, but you know that there's a place where you can get in. Two talked about a lot yesterday about if. Questions will be more meaningful and your interactions as a result will be as well. Questions that can be solved through a simple Google search should be probably solved through a simple Google search or now chat GPT. Um, but you learn of, you know, getting involved in these topics and, and making community part of the solution. So yeah, we've got lots of ghosts being shared in the chat uh, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there'll be even more by the time I go over there to check. But I thought, thank you very much for that presentation. That was wonderful. And as always, a pleasure to have you with us. See you. Bye. All right, man. Take care. Cheers. Next up, in terms of special presentation, if you could turn on your camera and microphone. Hello. So there is a lightning issue. So if you can give me a time, I will bring a torch. Yep. Take your yep, time. Take your uh, time. I can I will, I Yeah. So there is a lightning issue. So sorry for that. Just give me a minute and I will uh, bring a torch if you don't mind. Not a problem. Not a problem. Atar, if you want to get back in, <laughs> it's okay. We'll get, we'll get Atar later playing guitar. But we can we can have a little little bit of my other guitars don't get angry. I um, hope you can see this. So. so we've got Bilal back with us. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Perfectly. Perfectly. So people already know you. People quite already well. know you quite well. <laughs> what that is? Sorry, there is a link in here. That's okay. That's okay. Um, um, can you can tell us what you've been working, what you've been working on? on? You've been doing a special. Did you listen to? Did you listen to? Uh, yeah, so there is basically I completed a challenge about uh, the Kelsey High to World Teacher Space, and uh, that challenge basically, uh, if you take a look at this, uh, uh, let me just share the screen so that you can uh, all the viewers can see it. Yeah, screen. Mm, yeah, here it is. All right. So basically, uh, I recently completed a challenge about uh, the Kelsey High to Work Twitter space, and the challenge was that I listened to the Kelsey High to Work Twitter space about the topic of data based on Kubernetes, and uh, in that uh, Twitter space, it was about 15 minutes, and in that Twitter space, I uh, listened to that, and um, some of the things that I didn't understand, and after that, I realized why not make a report that I was making in the Document Explorers program. Why not make the same report as uh, as it was made previously? So, uh, in which the problems will be kept on one side and the solution will also be kept on one side. In which I will find all the solutions of the problems, all the questions that I face, uh, all the questions that I have, and all the problems that I uh, that I have in, according to these according to the Twitter space and what the Kelsey is talking about. So that in this in this way. The community can also learn from it, and I made this challenge open in the Doc Community Explorer program so that other people can also uh, find the answers of these questions. So, if you take a look at this, this is the report that I uh, created, and basically, these are all the resources that I uh, got help from. Like uh, the um, there is a still need for integrations, the Kubernetes for stateful applications, and there is a database Kubernetes and this panel discussion. And Kelsey High to Work Twitter Space that I listened on 11th February. So these are these are the resources that I got help from. And after that, I uh, made a table, and this table was basically the question, the term, and the minutes, paragraph, speaker, and my answers were present. So I searched these answers, and I uh, um, basically uh, talked about these answers in the YouTube format. In the YouTube videos format, and I also wrote a blog about these topics. Also, so basically, if you take a look at this, I if I scroll down, there are 20 questions that I found, and this uh, these 20, uh, 20 questions were discussed in 10 videos and 10 blog posts. So I completed this challenge, and, uh, and, and after the 20th question was completed, I announced on Twitter that hey friends, I recently completed my Kelsey High to Work Twitter Space challenge. And I wanted to invite the uh, Kelsey High to Work on Twitter space that I'm hosting on uh, in, uh, tomorrow. And uh, Kelsey uh, answered to me that, hey, uh, you can shout out to me on DM and I will be, uh, I will manage it uh, if uh, to see that whether I can arrange my timing and uh, attend the Twitter space. So I DM him and basically, he uh, replied to me and we set up a schedule and the Twitter space uh, that is going to be happening in will be on tomorrow, 9, uh, 10 p.m. IST. So this is the Twitter space link, uh, basically. Uh, I will share it on your Twitter, so don't worry about it. So uh, yeah, so in which I will learn a lot of things from the Kelsey and I will also get the feedback of, uh, about my challenge that I have done. So he can give me, uh, he can give me the feedbacks and I will also um, learn a lot of things, more things from uh, him that I didn't uh, learn uh, because uh, uh, Kelsey is not uh, some ordinary person. He has authority in Kubernetes and he know a lot of things than us. So we should be attending these uh, um, Twitter space. And I invite every Docker explorers uh, to come to this Twitter space tomorrow and uh, so that we can ask questions and uh, be engaged with him and so that we can learn from him. Yeah. Sorry, one second. Sorry, one second. So, can so you just share, share those your biggest learning, biggest from, this learning from this process? What's the most exciting, What's the most exciting or interesting, or interesting or surprising things? Surprising things, 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 things. things. So I uh, basically the, all the questions were uh, present on Google, so there is nothing that you can uh, say. But the thing that I uh, uh, found interesting is that uh, there were uh, uh, this, uh, the resources were scattered and. Uh, I uh, 
it took me some time to uh, find the solutions or to find the solutions but ultimately i found uh, solutions from different community members and i uh, reached to different people so that they can help me and from them i uh, from them i found other resources so it was not just only limited to google uh, but instead i uh, approached to other members also who led me to other resources that they can help me so yeah this was an exciting journey it was not just limited to google so i learned from other people also that helped me finding the resources yeah Fantastic. Great job, Alaf. I left to the Twitter spaces. Twitter spaces. Um, the Twitter spaces. Um, the Twitter spaces. The people can attend. 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 The people very very productive very very productive but i think it's just a great, sign, just a great sign everybody, that, that, if everybody it, that if you put the work in it takes time it takes time but, you know kelsey but, is about, you know, Kelsey's Kelsey's about, about on twitter he's written various books he's written various uh, books uh, uh, i don't know he's written, written various books about various books about kubernetes and figures and figures ecosystem ecosystem and and his time 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 it's not about Inquisitive. It's about being curious. It's about, it's about, curious. It's about answers, answers, to questions. answers to questions. Doesn't matter. Like doesn't I said, matter. Like, like I said, that's not the matter. Matters. Put in. Put in. And people with a lot of skill. Free time. Free time. They're making time. They're making time. And they're over seen and appreciated. Appreciated. Right. So we will. We will. It's not fair if I only applaud. So yeah, like I said, congratulations, Bilal. I think it's absolutely amazing. And it's a great example that other people can keep in mind that if you put, if you show up, if you ask questions, if you're involved, that, it, and it's not going to happen necessarily on the first time. All right. And, but it's just, there are results coming out of this. So super congratulations tomorrow. Ask. And looking forward to the interaction. And looking forward to the interaction. Yeah, uh, I'm really happy to be uh, there, and I want everyone to be present there. So, Dr. Community Explorers, I want everyone to be present there so that they can learn and uh, they can uh, learn from Kelsey and uh, all the things that we have done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, like I said, I dropped the link in the chat so everyone can set reminders, share, let everybody know. Mm -hmm. And um, looking forward to that tomorrow. And we have a talk from you today as well, Bilal, about operators. We'll be seeing you soon. very much. Take care. Okay, okay, okay. So next up, I got to get into my... Our next speaker um, is someone who's very near and dear to my heart, has been one of my mentors, actually, in the whole community space, because I, when I got... In, in the CNCF. She is a CNCF ambassador. She's very, very active, um, doing lots and lots of cool stuff. And I'm going to try to find her video right now. Let's see. Uh, her name is Lisa Marie Nemphy. All right. And she is a for advocacy at CockroachDB. All right. So let me get down here. Sorry. Sorry. So, you know, we all know that it's, it's, the area of developer um, from different people that are that are working in that working in that space to share knowledge to other folks if they're interested in becoming a DevRel. What things they should keep in mind? What what are the best things? You share uh, Lisa's link right here. No, don't worry, Anushka. Yeah, we'll get Courtney later on. Yeah, Courtney's amazing, um, and Courtney lives uh, quite close to me actually here in, in the same part of Spain. So yeah, like I said, here's uh here's Lisa's here's Lisa's what you call it um sorry Twitter link all right we'll close that out and we can get that going
order to have a successful process and journey, I'm happy to be with Lisa. She has guided me a ton how to get involved, how to learn, how to listen so much that we'll be giving a talk in KubeCon about that. But I want to hear more from her about how you can make community a proper part of your strategy. What are things that have worked for her? She's built and led and continues to build and lead some amazing communities. So anyway, Lisa, happy to be here with you today. If you want to just give a quick intro about your community story and then share some practical advice for folks out there. Thanks, Bart. Wow, that was an incredibly generous introduction. I'm I'm flattered. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Lisa, Lisa Marie Namphy, officially. I work for Cockroach Labs. That's the company behind Cockroach TV. And I run developer relations at Cockroach Labs. Um, I am also a CNCF ambassador, and I run an incredibly large user community here in the San Francisco Bay Area called Cloud Native Containers, and have been running that for uh, 10 years now, at least here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so we've represented a lot of open source technology over the years, including OpenStack, Kubernetes, of course, Docker, or even Mesosphere, um, and a lot of small projects along the way. So you name it. And the reason I mention all those things is because if I try to put all of that on one slide, it sort of looks like the dog's breakfast. And that's the position a lot of us community architects and even developer advocates find ourselves in you find yourself doing multiple jobs. And when you're architecting different types of communities, you have to really, really think carefully about what are the goals of your community that you're building? Um, how are you gonna measure it? And really what type of community is it? You know, is this a project that needs a community? Is it a project that needs um, some kind of administration like uh, the Apache Foundation or the, the CNCF? Um, or is it a project you know, are you trying to build upstream contributors? Uh, is it doc writers you're looking for? So you really have to think through all of these things. And that's very, very important. And I like to think about this as there's three different types of communities with these different goals. And the easiest way to get started and get involved is to join an open source community and start contributing. And there's lots of ways to contribute. You can contribute code upstream or you can contribute um, to docs. You can run meetups. There are so many different things you can write, 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 write about the technology. I wrote two books on OpenStack um, and that was one way I got into the community and started contributing even before I was running the user group in the Bay Area. So. Um, that's the best way to get started is to join an open source community that's already established and start to meet people and understand where the gaps are. And those communities can be things like Kubernetes, OpenStack, Docker, or can be around a project like Istio or one of my personal favorites, Argo Project. There's a lot of ways and projects that, that do need doc writers. Newsflash, they all need doc writers um, and lots of other types of contribution upstream. And then you can start running meetups around that and going to the conferences and developing talks and, and somehow getting the word out about the product or the project. Um, and that's a great way to start with developer advocacy. Another type of community is a community of local members anchored around a concept like cloud native or containers or surface mesh or networking, security, data on Kubernetes, so those are concepts and those are very important um, ways to segment communities so that people understand what they're going to see and learn about. And, you know, if they happen to want to fix security on Kubernetes, you know, if you wait for the Kubernetes user group to come around for a meetup on that topic, um, it might not be as, you know, as often as if you started a securities meetup, cloud native security, so to speak. So like, Cloud Native Containers gives me a lot of flexibility to talk about a lot of different types of technologies and showcase a lot of end user stories, um, which I think is always important. Uh, those are the things not to forget about. The training, another really important part of um, advocacy and community building. Uh, so if you anchor it around um, a concept, then that gives you a lot of flexibility. The third type of community, and this is the trap a lot of us fall into, is a community around one technology. This could be fabulous. Puppet did an incredible job in the early stages building the Puppet camps everywhere. Docker did an amazing job with this. Um, and they had captains and you know community members and, and meetups all over the world. 
or even something like OpenShift, which is coming from one company like Red Hat or Cockroach TV, which is coming from one co company like Cockroach Labs. Um, so then when you're building a community around uh, one technology, it's it's a little bit different because you might not be looking for upstream contributors. You might just be looking for um, user stories and to to get the word out um, about this technology and to figure out ways to interact with and engage with your users. And, and that's harder than just how, even if your project is open source, like CockroachDB, um, it, it's harder to focus on one technology and build a whole community around that one. It's, I would say, easier to take that one technology to where it's relevant and, you know, who are you partnering with? Where do your users hang out? And then, you know, work with those user groups and those meetups to, to really get traction in, and start building your community. So those three different types of community building are extremely important um, to, to keep, to differentiate, I would say. Uh, another thing I think people don't really think about is why do you want to build your community? I mean, you ask yourself if it's around a project or a technology, um, why do you want the community? Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with community, you know, and, and, and what makes up your community? Like think about all the segments you want to list out and which segments of the community do you want to focus on first? So the things to really focus on up front is setting your goals, very clear goals, understanding who your community is, learning how and what can be measured. I would say um, seeking out your community, building in unlikely places, like going to hackathons, maybe coder schools, you know, finding... Um, where people can, uh, where, where it's easy for you to showcase your open source technology and get it adopted by community members. And hackathons is one thing that a lot of people don't think about. Um, obviously, community building involves a large amount of empathy, practicing empathy, listening and teaching, um, but really uh, the content is huge. So as you build community, make sure you're offering something to your community, which is usually around some really great content. Um, if it's a community around developer tools, I mean, maybe you've built some sample apps or something to get to get them started. You know, there's lots of ways to, to think through uh, how to get your community started in the first place. Or if you're a developer advocate, you know, what, what are you going to, um, what are you going to build first to, to help show that, you know, the fun and the love and, and how much joy folks can get out of working with your technology and joining your community or even contributing to it upstream. So I think the third thing that is the most important thing maybe is choosing how and what can be measured and then figuring out how to measure that. So back to the different types of communities we talked about and figuring out what the goals of those communities are, then figure out how to measure these metrics that you decided were important or that your sponsors might think were important. So I, there's tools out there that can help you, tools like Orbit and Common Room. Um, but there's also just uh, it's really about goal setting and aligning those goals with the goals of your sponsor. And your sponsor could be your corporation that's paying you if you're basing your developer advocacy around a certain technology, or your sponsor could be whoever is helping support the user group and contributing to that, whether they're helping host a meetup or paying for some beer and pizza. So those are things to understand what is important to your sponsors so that you can continue with this community building and um, and how to measure that and, and report that back. So if I can summarize, you know, community is amazing. Building community is incredibly rewarding. It's, you know, it's something that you have to have a lot of passion and heart to do or you're absolutely going to burn out. So I always say find the people who are doing it like they're not getting paid to do it because those are the folks that are going to do it with love and do it with the, the right amount of um, compassion <laughs> and inclusivity. And all of these things are super important. And find those organizers that have a lot of diversity um, in the people, but in also um, the type of skills. So, you know, community takes all types, right? You definitely need your technical contributors. You need your, your doc writers, your trainers, your, your meetup organizers. It takes all types. And if you have diversity of talent, then you're going to have enough people that are going to help you continue on this journey or you're going to end up doing it all and it's going to it's going to be very difficult. 
So think about setting your goals up front, understand who your community is and what type of community you're building, learn how and what can be measured, um, think about all of the uh, the last mile um, of the different um, un, un, tangible, intangibles, you know, do you take your community to hackathons? Do you, do you anchor around charities and make that um, the drive to help build a community? Lots of different things that are um, intangibles a lot of people don't think about. And then um, don't forget to always practice empathy, listen, make sure inclusivity is part of your goals, accessibility, DEI, all of that stuff have to be part of your goals up front or it's not going to happen. And then the content, the content is key. You're either building the best possible product you can and delivering that to the community or you're building the best community you can by delivering incredible um, incredible end user stories and content throughout your ecosystem and showcasing community members. If you have great content, you will keep your community tight and you'll keep people coming back especially if you're running user groups. So those are kind of my um, things to watch out for. And I'm always happy to do a deeper dive. Bart, if you want to talk about this more and in more detail, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. This is my community too. And um, hopefully we'll all get to meet in person in real life at some point. So hopefully I'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Bart. Really appreciate it. Okay, very, very good. Amazing stuff from Lisa, great insights. Uh, once as you experience, very, very practical things because it can be overwhelming, right? What are your objective stakeholders? What are the different roles inside of a community? What's gonna work best for them? Which communities are gonna work best for them? All those things are really important. A lot of times seeing a lot of folks out there with a lot of to decide what those goals and objectives are. And very common stretch too thin, having too much on their plates and in order to make sure that you're able to do your job correctly and, and with fair expectations. That being said, we're gonna move it over to our next person named Courtney Nickerson, all right? It's a, a very interesting coincidence. We live. That being said, let's give Courtney the floor. So, give to anyone who's interested. Sure. Um, I think tip number one a, no matter what your background is or what you're currently doing, the first thing to do is start advocating for developers in whatever role you're in. Uh, and not just for developers, for all stakeholders within whatever that pipeline of work is um, that developers are involved in. You really have to understand developers and the people that they're working with or working against, depending on how they look at it, um, in order to get their job done. And, and you can do that regardless of, of what you're currently doing now, whether you're even in the tech industry, if you're interested in this, this is something you can get involved in. Uh, through open source projects, through communities, and through other things. So I think that's the first step, um, is getting to know as many developers as you can and advocating for them regardless of what role you're in currently. Uh, that would be my number one. Number two, it, it doesn't matter if you come from a technical background or not. You can totally do this role. Uh, that said, it's really challenging. So if you are somebody like myself who doesn't, have, doesn't come from a technical background, uh, the second thing you need to do is start working on that. That doesn't mean that you have to be an expert in everything. It doesn't mean that you're going to learn everything overnight, but it does mean that you have an interest in it and that you are pushing yourself in order to learn a different things and aspects that the people that you're advocating for actually do so that you have a cool and deep understanding of what's going on for them um, and, and can better understand the different hurdles that they have. Likewise, if you are a technical backgrounded person, don't think you've got it made in DevRel. DevRel is a super diverse role. Um, it's always questioned, what does DevRel actually do? And that's because it's a very interdisciplinary place to be. So if you're a technically backgrounded person, you need to start working on communication skills, be learning things about marketing jargon, a, understand a sales process, because while you are not sales, you will have to have conversations with people on your sales team. Um, and, and you need to be able to understand 
their world as well. Because the truth is you're advocating for your company and your product. You are the, advocating internally and externally at all times. So you really do have to understand not just developers, but also the people on your team that you're going to be um, working with. So people coming from a non-technical background might have a bit more of an advantage in terms of internal advocacy and external is where they need to work on. Um, but for people that are super technically backgrounded, eh, they really need to jump into the deep end of figuring out how to advocate internally with other stakeholders in, in their product because you have to have some knowledge of what's going on there. Uh, and tip number three, I would say, is learn how to ask a lot of questions and be curious, but also learn how to actively listen. Your job really is to ask questions externally of your users, get a real understanding of what they like, what they dislike, what you're not providing for them, why they need that, and then take that information that you've actively gotten and go back and tell people actively in your company um, this is what's going on. This is what people love. Let's do more of this. This is what they don't like. This is what we need to provide them. This is where trends are going. And then you need to actively listen to your team as well, because you've got your own development team that's going to say, great, we can do this, but we can't do that. And you need to be able to go tell your users as well. So be curious, I think is really, really important. Um, as actively asking questions and then learning how to listen to that and abstract the information, take it back and report it to people on both sides, whether it's internally or externally. Very, very good. Wonderful. So we see a mixture of, of technical, non-technical skills, what some might call soft skills or, or transversal skills and, and being open-minded to all those different stakeholders who are involved in the process. Courtney, this is fantastic, short and sweet. You're out there. You're very, very active. If folks want to interact with you, you're, you're on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, you're on various Slacks and, and looking forward to, to hanging out in KubeCon as well. And in the meantime, keep up the amazing work. All right. Cheers. Wonderful presentation from Courtney. Once again, very, very practical. So I'm sure you got a lot out of that. Our next speaker is a person who is very near and dear to my heart. And just in the same way we were talking about Bilal, about putting yourself out what you can do, it's very difficult for them to know. That people don't have a lot of time. You gotta have some way to make yourself visible. GitHub repo, it could be a personal project. You could be participating in a community. You don't have But like I said, there are lots of different ways to get involved is someone who I encountered in the community very early on. And now that she had done some amazing slides, mentioned that, um, that, uh, that this, you know, that this person, that her name is Nellie, had done, had done the artwork. So Nellie joined her community and um, very quickly created the first in, in KubeCon. The different concepts that were works, so like I said, I'll I'll drop her link in uh, in the chat. Her video. Where are you? So <clears throat> Nelly is now working as a software engineer, and her talk is about how to software engineer. A year and a half now. Here we go. Thank you, Mart. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Nellie Toby. I'm a forward deployed engineer at Jellyfish, and I've been uh, at it. And what I want to talk about today is breaking into tech. And I don't particularly, I'm not fond of the term breaking into tech because it makes it sound like you're doing something wrong. And you're not doing something wrong. You belong here, you deserve to be here and let's get you invited to that party. Um, these are four of the things that I found most valuable in my journey and everybody's journey is gonna be unique. Um, I wanna preface this by saying that uh, I have no college degree. I tried college and college was not my cup of tea. Um, I'm more of a coffee girl. Um, these are the four things that I think were the most valuable to my me getting in. 
and for reasons I'll explain. Um, the first one is networking. Um, we all know the DLK communities. It's an amazing place. I've, I got involved and I got to do all these things and I've done all these videos and presentations now, things I never thought I would see myself doing. And it was all because I had amazing people um, encouraging me and backing me up. And I, I can't say enough about, you can't find yourself in the right place at the right time if you never get out there and go places. You gotta, you gotta present yourself, you gotta be there. Um, this is how you make meaningful connections uh, nowadays <laughs> is social media and participating in groups and things. And <laughs> and this is what you want to do. You, you want to be out there because you're going to be the next coworker for this next great job you're going to get. And you want to show them who that coworker is. You don't want to be just bullet points on a resume. You don't want to be just your tech stack. You're a human being and you're their next coworker and you want to be that, that person that they want to work with. And that leads to soft skills. Um, when I first joined tech, there was all this new terminology being thrown at me, stuff I'd never heard of before, because I come from the restaurant industry. I come from service industry and, and industrial jobs. And so when I heard soft skills, first thing I thought of was restaurant work. And I'm not saying go out there and get a job at McDonald's, but if, if you can afford the opportunity to volunteer in some kind of service job, um, that's valuable experience. That's something you can bring to the table when you're at your interview and when you're, you're trying to get your job. Um, build, build, build. This is, I, I, I say this all the time on Twitter too, you know, you just keep building. Um, you don't want to be trying to build the next monolithic app, the next Google, uh, because you're losing out on the variety and the diversity you can get from building lots of small projects. Um, and the, Failures are, are a great way to learn. And if you're only doing the one thing, you're, you're missing out on some of those failures. Um, I love to build games and I, I attribute a lot of me getting into my job at Jellyfish because I was building a lot of games and I was enjoying it, I was loving it. And I had a mock interview with a, with a friend and it was to build Minesweeper. And I spent about an hour and I didn't get very far, but I was told I did really good but I couldn't give up. Like I, now I wanted to build this game and I ended up building it that night and sending it to my new friend. And that led to my interviews at Jellyfish. Certificates, um, there's all kinds of certificates you can get. The, the important thing about certificates, I think, is uh, building your confidence and building that, that, that knowing inside yourself that you can do this. Um, there's there's free ones, there's expensive ones, there's everything in between. But I really think certificates really helped me to build the confidence to say, you know, I can do this and I got proof I can do this. And lastly, be yourself. Um, you bring valuable things to the table. Uh, you, all your experiences, all your, your work you've done, even if you're, if you were a barista at Starbucks, if you were, um, you know, a chef in a restaurant, if you were driving around a Kubota, pushing trash around in a, in a place, all these, all those things involve problem solving, all those things involve soft skills, and you bring a lot to the table, and you need to believe that, because you got this, and you can do this, and I believe in you. Can't wait to see you at the party. All righty. Very, very good. Amazing, amazing presentation full of practical knowledge. And like I said, Nellie's a, a living and breathing example of, of the power of putting yourself out there and making it easy for people to know what you can do. Um, so anyway, really, really enjoyed that. And, and as she said as well, you know, well, it's good to have ambitions of I'm going to build the next Google bigger thing, right? So starting off with smaller things and then scaling um, next up, we've got Rohan. All right, so Rohan, back to the beginning. My name is Rohan. Today we are going to learn what are operators. Let's get started with the presentation. Applications. A stateless system send a request to the server and relays the response without storing any information. On the other hand, the stateful system expects a response, track information, 
and resend the request if no response is received. So this is how this concept emerges. But first of all, let's learn about the stateful and stateless applications. Let's go through examples, use case. Let's say we are deploying the application into Kubernetes clusters. So you create a deployment, configuration map, and service, and application starts. Maybe you scale an application into three replicas. If one replica died, then it recover with the system called control loop with new one. If you release new version, just exit adjust deployment configuration. And there is no backup for state applications. Kubernetes know your desires and automatically update it. Now for web applications, you need databases, but this process are not straightforward. You need more handling throughout the whole life cycle. So Kubernetes cannot do all these stuffs for stateful applications. Why? Because it's you create three replicas. These all are different and have own state and identity. That that make difficulties. The order is very important. The connection and synchronization with replica should be there every time. So stateful application requires manual work, and it goes against the main Kubernetes, like the automation. So how to manage stateful application? So how to manage stateful applications? There come operators. Operators basically remove human operators with software operators. So all the tests that DevOps team do now. It will does by operators like slide. This means the tasks are reusable. Now, how does operator works? Uh, it has some control loop mechanism. Uh, watches for changes. A replica die. Uh, it has some control loop mechanism. Watches for changes. If replica dies, it create new one. It upgrades the whole applications whenever needed. It also uses CRD, custom resource definitions. From this, you can create your own customs. So operators automates the entire life cycle. And these are some examples of operators. If you do like to engage with the doc community and discuss operator further, we invite you to join the Slack. And these are my social handles. Thank you. All right, excellent job, Rohan. Let me get back here. Good. Next up, we are going to continue with the subject of operators, and we have Bilal, who we heard from earlier. All right, and we're going to get over here. Very good. <laughs> Hey friends, welcome. my name is Bilal Khan and today I'm going to talk about operators. But before talking about operators, let me just uh, tell you unique things about myself that I'm a slow learner and a procrastinator. All right. So here is a question for you. And this question is relevant to a problem that will the Kubernetes create a copy of the stateful application if it is failed. All right. So if you don't know about the stateful and stateless applications, then here are the definitions. So basically, the stateful application will store the data to keep the track of its state. All right. So it means that the data will be present in some kind of storage. But if we take a look at the stateless application, so it does not keep the record of the state. So each request is completely new for it. All right. So let's take a look at the question that I asked before that will the Kubernetes create a copy of the stateful application if it is spared? So the direct answer for this is no, it won't create a copy of the stateful application. But the indirect answer is yes. Yes, it will create a copy of the stateful application if it is paid, but with the help of operators. 
All right. So the operators are kind of um, a mechanism or an extension mechanism that will basically help the Kubernetes to create a copy of the stateful application. So let's take a look at the definition of it. So operator is an extension mechanism that will functionalize the stateful applications to run on Kubernetes. Although you cannot run the stateful application directly on Kubernetes, instead the operators will help you run applications on the Kubernetes. All right. So here's the difference. Uh, as you can see here, the Kubernetes versus Helm charts. So Helm takes the Kubernetes components and bundles them into packages. All right. And now as charts that can be versioned and shipped to cluster for deployment. So basically the Helm will take the Kubernetes component and package them together. And after that, this package will be called the charts and that chart will be shipped to the cluster for deployment. All right. So if you don't know about the help chart, you can check out my YouTube videos. I have explained there. All right. So operators are built from help charts without writing any code by using Kubernetes of operator software development kit. All right. So with the help of Helm charts, you can build the operators without writing any code. So you can search this term SDK and you will find it. All right. So these are some of the takeaways. So slow learning and procrastinating is not a bad thing. All right. And operators extend the functionality of the Kubernetes and help charts make the operators development easy. All right. So these are some of the stats. As you can see here that on the left side, these are some of the percentage of the database, persistent storage, analytics, etc. that are basically using the Kubernetes operators. But if we take a look at the right side percentage, they are planning to use the Kubernetes operator in the future. All right. And you can uh, read further about it in the Doc Community 2020-22 report. Here is the link of it that you can visit it. All right. And you can also contact me uh, with the, uh, on YouTube, GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, Hashnode, or you can buy me a coffee if you want to. All right. So that's it for now. So I hope you like this video and understand it. So if you liked it, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you have any questions, then ask those questions in the comment section below. I'll be happy to answer all of them. So till then, goodbye. All right, amazing job, Bilal. That was fantastic. Next up, we've got Yash. So Yash did a presentation about streaming, right? So real-time data streaming. Gonna get into his real quick. All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the streaming. Hello, everyone. Myself from India, currently running DevOps and a cloud native enthusiast, an open source contributor and a tech blogger. So before moving to the topic, I would like to discuss what is streaming. Streaming is watching and listening to audio or video or other form of multimedia content over the internet in real time. And it, it is a way of consuming content without having to download it first. If you consider, for example, listening to music over Spotify or watching videos over internet, you are streaming a content. The data is sent to a device in a small pieces we call as packets, allowing you to start listening and watching almost immediately while the remaining content loads in the background. Also, why Kubernetes for data streaming? Kubernetes provides a powerful and scalable container orchestral system which helps in deploying and scaling of a containerized application in real time. It, it provides an ideal platform for managing and processing larger volume of data in real time, along with providing the feature of load balancing, auto scaling, and fault tolerance. So what is the purpose of data streaming in Kubernetes? Kubernetes data streaming enables continuous and real-time data processing and transfer. Data has been transferred in the form of packets and not in batches, due to which application make more informed decision, respond faster to the events, and handle larger amount of data. So there are various data streaming technologies, including Pulsar, Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, Heapster, FluentD, and so on in today's world. So what are challenges do data streaming application encounter. Running data streaming application in Kubernetes requires ensuring reliability and consistency in the, of, in the face of failure and dynamic cluster changes. And to overcome all such challenges, you need to have a specialized streaming data processing framework optimized for real-time processing, optimized resource allocation using Kubernetes auto-scaling feature, and the use of monitoring and debugging tools such as Prometheus and Grafana, and making use of Kubernetes operator. So what are the future of data streaming. 
As data streaming become incredibly popular in today's world, Kubernetes is expected to play a significant and a crucial role in shaping the future of the technology. Providing a platform and scalable platform for managing the processing larger volume of data in real time. Kubernetes is suitable for modern data streaming, it has container orchestration, auto scaling, and fault tolerance feature. So, now what are the key takeaways from this session? We can we like to say that Kubernetes is mainly used for scaling data streaming application with the key features of container orchestrator, fault tolerance, and auto scaling, and due to which it simplifies the streamlined application management smoothly with a real time big data processing in today's world. And due to all such reasons, Kubernetes is mainly considered to be the future of data streaming application. If you want, and if you want to learn more about how organizations are using Kubernetes as a data streaming application, do check out the DOK report, 2022 report. And if you want to talk more about streaming, then do join a DOK community on Slack. So thank you. And if you liked, and that's it for this session. And if you like to hear, talk more and like to give feedback, do connect with on the following social links. Thank you. All righty. Very good job, Yash. Getting all that information in a very practical manner in a short period of time. We are going to take our and uh, this time, I'm not going to play guitar. As someone who's much for a long time, uh, Maserati, amazing, amazing guitarist. that have been nominated for Emmys, and he is a currently uh, a podcast creator for a program or formerly incarcerated people learn programming to get back there my screen get to here we go bring it over there Perfect, yeah, yeah. No lie, yeah, yeah. I've, I know I'm so far from perfect, but I know I can speak for more than one person. When I say I, I'm so tired of hurting, we could change the world forever if we come together, we can break them all. Oh. Yeah, we can break the mold. No lie. Yeah, we can break the mold. We can break the mold. We could change the world forever if we come together. We can break the mold. Mentally constipated, shit on my mind, but can't come out. Surrounded by cats and real some fake observing way to make them out. Who's who? Really ain't got a clue, man. Think it do cool, man. Kicking it like Luke Kane till you see a few things. You see on two lanes. I take go to two chains. Now time to change. You part of your group, man. I do the big crew thing. That's a method, man. No Wu Tang goose too loose. Like shoes with no shoe strings. Try to lace them, but they burn like butane when you in the deuce. Flame to the equation. Try not to give up on my people and be patient. But the reality of the situation. Large part of the population can't save them. Hopefully they see the truth. The reason that I care so much, cause I've been through so much, trying to spare the young from the things I've done and thinking them and they seen the guns and drugs in the slums. To where you from? To where I'm from? It's all the same thing, just in different ways. It's all the same pain, just a different place. Same conclusion, just a different pace. So I'm trying to break the mold. I'm trying to take control of the mind of the masses. I won't stop to the death can hear it loud and clearly. And the blind see it happen. And that's deeper than rapping. I speak out of passion, no lie, please feel me. We all victims that I really lynch later, but if we come together so much better we will be i know i'm so far from perfect but i know i can speak for more than one person when i say i i'm so tired of hurting we could change the world forever if we come together we can break the mold oh yeah we can break the mold no lie yeah we can break the mold we can break the mold we could change the world forever if we come together. We can break the mold. Product of my environment, at least that's what we're told. And you don't plan for retirement when you program the blow girls and sell dope. To the day that you gone, bro, I swear it's so cold when you gotta go home. A place where you grow thinking hope was a joke and everybody broke thinking that's how I go for somebody like me. Just another young brother from the streets where you gotta see the beauty and the beast, but the we can't eat, but we can't leave. But how can we stay free when they lock us in prison when we've been in prison the blacks? When no equal opportunity, go for jobs or protection will come from a glide. When will it stop? Some will say never, but you never know till you make that and never. No lie, ties to the lies, my be seven so high. Try to get a world of perception so fly that you fly away to a higher place.
this when you was told you couldn't reach it. Open your eyes today. If you alive today, we can break the mold in the pieces all around the globe. We can break the mold. It's in our control. You got to let go. It's frivolous. Whoa, do better to show. Do you something better instead of robbing them for their innocence? And that's deeper than rapping. I speak out of passion a lot. Please feel me. We are victims of the bully lynch letter, but if we come together so much better, we will be. I know I am so far from perfect, but I know I can speak for more than one person when I say I am so tired of hurting. We could change the world forever if we come together. We can break the mold. Oh, yeah, we can break the mold. No lie, yeah, we can break the mold. We can break the mold. We could change the world forever if we come together. We can break the mold. <clears throat> All right. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Next, back one of our former interns who's going to share some very, very practical knowledge. Let's get him on here. Uh, we've been having interns in our community for quite a while, and one of the ones who's got an amazing story to tell is Abhishek. He uh, came onto our radar since then, and amazing to see the work he's doing now. So Abhishek, really quickly, just let folks know who you are and, and how you found out about DOK. Hi, everyone. I'm Abhishek. I call myself a geeky, ambivert, and a workaholic person who thinks sarcasm is seriously important, just like Bart, you know. It, he also <laughs> thinks that sarcasm is seriously important. And I came into the radar of data on Kubernetes community when I was just starting out with learning Kubernetes and the cloud native ecosystem. I used to see a lot of folks being really active in the community, and there are uh, the initial interns, Kevalya, Karuna, and uh, uh, Ashwin, uh, not, I'm sorry, not Ashwin. Don't uh, worry, yeah, but, but Kunal. and, and Kunal, yeah. <laughs> There's so many yeah. people to remember. It's all good. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So they were super helpful people, and I used to be like, okay, uh, uh, I'm getting on so much uh, help from help from this community, then why not coming and to this community and giving back in all the way I can. So yeah, that's how I came into the DOK community uh, radar. And uh, I am pretty much all about deep core technology, geeky kind of, stuff yeah no no definitely and and you know you jumped right in i think it's a very good lesson to all the folks that are out there that are kind of worried or feeling overwhelmed is like hey uh what's the best way to start you know where where are you? just 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 do it just get involved so can definitely. you tell us now about can you tell us now about you know the kind of stuff you're working on now yeah, I've been working uh, in the cloud native ecosystem uh, uh, ever since I started. Previously, I worked at Nirmata as a software engineering intern, where I did a lot of cloud native wizardry. And now I'm working at API 7. Uh, we, we are working on an, uh, in the open source project called API 6. That is a cloud native API gateway. And ever since I started learning about tech, doing coding, I, I understood that I'm all about uh, the places in tech where it, the there is very high uh, incentive for optimization and high performance and very uh, tweaking uh, very much close to op operating system and hardware. So I'm doing that kind of work and I'm very grateful for that. And I also feel very happy that I'm getting to work on uh, this, this kind of technology and so many cool uh, people around me. That's great. And yeah, API 6 is an amazing technology, quite advanced. But once again, with your spirit of I just jump right in, I start consuming resources, I ask questions, interact. With that in mind, what have been some of your you know, biggest learnings and you know, tips that you might give to other folks that are in a similar situation that you were in, let's say, a year and a half, two years ago? I think my biggest learning uh, would be the ability and the, and the mindset of figuring out always because there are a lot of ways or a lot of roadmaps. Everyone has a different story. Everyone has different resources and the environment they are in. So one story might not be applicable for others. And someone, how, uh, someone has made it in X, Y, Z way that might not work for some, someone else. So th there's a, a saying that, that, that says that there's no silver bullet. So understanding this and constantly working, being consistent, that's very important and constantly figuring out what works for you, how you can go ahead and how you can implement things on your own and what finding what works for you in the best way. That is being, that's been very helpful for me. And I think this, this will work for everyone. 
although yeah. i just said that there's no silver bullet but this is the silver bullet that should work and that's that's great and that, no i think that's it's a wonderful reflection because it it's true and and i find myself having that conversation a lot is like as much as there are different strategies and you know we can make it as complex as we want at the end of the day being able to go out there and and look for information the amount of times i find myself i find myself sending a screenshot of a question that somebody asked me of putting that in Google is like, like, I'm happy to help you, but you also mm. need to know how to help yourself. You know, Definitely. there's no better help than self-help. Of course you want to involve communities in your strategy and your process. And of course you want to be able to interact with others, but there is a very important component of going up and, and getting access to all the resources that there, there's tons of blogs, there's documentation, there are videos, there are lots of different places where you can check things out. Do yourself the favor of figuring out what you're interested in, figuring out how you can take that a little bit further, and then that's when you're you're going to uh, reap the benefits of being involved in communities where you can get more detailed questions answered, better responses to those kind of issues. Um, so I think that's that's fantastic advice. That there is no silver bullet, but there is at the same time, and it's called putting yes. in the time. Yeah, putting in the time and yeah. and 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 sharing and you know sharing your progress. Um, are, is there anything, you know, that's kind of on your mind right now, any sort of events that you're checking out, anything that you're learning that, um, that you want to, you want to share with folks so they can take a look as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you are into cloud native and if you are into deep technology where there is a lot, in, a lot of incentive for making optimizations and making sure your code runs well and it does not break any other part, then you are highly welcome at API six. This is a very cool open source project and folks that are working in api6 are the brightest of the brains that i have seen and um, come and experience yourself that's what i can say because this is just mind blowing that's great and like you said you know you have to you have to sort of live it to really know what it's like yep. and like i said with the the talk that we had with someone from api6 uh, last year was and the thing is we've done over you know 200 live streams and so the one that we do with api series is like okay this you know there's normally a high level and this one's going really high so um i i definitely echo your message there abhishek thank you so much for your time i'll look forward to interacting with you whether it's in kubecon or anything else going on the cncf and folks definitely check out api6 if you want to get uh, into the deeper side and remember abhishek's advice Take the time to give yourself time to go investigate things, yes. do your research, do your homework, consume resources, and, and that's really going to be an important part of your journey. All right? Thanks a lot, man. We'll see you soon. Yes. Love it. All right. Abhishek rocks. I think that's obvious. Next up, we got Luckman talking about AI and ML on Kubernetes. All right? What's some of the new workloads that we saw in the 2022 research report? And so we're going to take a look at his talk now. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Dr. Shmoon. Today, today I'm going to be speaking about AI and what Kubernetes. Second student in the university. I'm um, okay, let's begin the introduction part. What is AI? Why is it so popular? Well, um, AI re uh, refers to a process and algorithm that is able to simulate a human intelligence, including perception, problem solving, and learning. Two examples of an AI is Alexa, Siri, personal assistants, self-driving, recommendation system, etc. We have few subsets of AI, which is machine learning and deep learning. Uh, machine learning is a subset of AI which is able to learn and develop over time, while um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning that attempts to emulate human, human neural network, which does eliminate the need of pre-processing data. Two examples of deep learning is spatial biometrics and um, natural language processing. Such as ChatGPT is very popular nowadays. Um, after the next topic, uh, why is AI ML important? As we know, data is a very important asset for businesses, and it grows, it keeps growing at an exponential rate, which can be unmanageable if there's no automated system to manage it. So this is where this is where AI ML comes in place. Uh, AI ML can give organizations a way to extract value out of data they collect and deliver business insights. Um, AI ML has few abilities to transform the business aspects by helping them achieve few outcomes, such as increasing customer satisfaction, increasing revenue, reducing costs, and automating business operations. Okay, so now to the interesting part, why do we need to move AI ML to Kubernetes? Well, here's the thing. Creating a model could take a few weeks, but deploying it to production could take a lot of time. And this is due to because of data quality and data availability, but it is also due to uh, the lack of collaboration 
uh, between the data scientists and IT teams. Uh, this problem occurs because of the difference of understanding how machine learning model works and how IT things work. So to fix this, we have Kubernetes. Uh, what Kubernetes does, it transforms the machine learning specs to uh, Kubernetes uh, compatible. So converting it to, uh, you know, converting the machine learning file to deploy to Kubernetes, we have a few tools. Uh, these tools are, uh, I've given a few examples, there are a lot more tools out there in the world. Uh, a few examples are Bent Omel, Kubeflow, and Selden. So what uh, these tools does is they provide networking and scalability features, and they help uh, machine learning models. We, I mean, they help to deploy machine learning models to Kubernetes. Um, all these tools uh, use uh, CRDs, which is basically like a custom resource definition. It basically extends the Kubernetes API by providing objects and features. Okay, so let's get into Kubeflow. Um, Kubeflow is an open source project that makes it easier to run machine learning workflows on top of Kubernetes. Uh, as you know, Kubernetes is a very popular uh, container management uh, tool. Uh, Kubeflow basically extends the capability to include machine learning workflows inside it. Uh, one of the key benefits of Kubeflow is that it provides a consistent environment for developing, training, and deploying machine learning models. This makes it easier to collaborate across teams uh, and to automate and uh, automate the deployment process. It also makes it easier to scale and manage resources so that you can quickly respond to changing demands. Uh, it also has a beautiful dashboard, as you can see right here. It has a lot of features such as notebooks, texture boards, volumes, pipelines, etc. It's such an uh, attractive feature for me personally. And uh, the next thing, I just want to show an example of a CRD of Kubeflow. This is basically known as a PM job. What it does is that it allows you to train a model on top of Kubernetes. If you are doing machine learning, I think come across the word TensorFlow. Well, let's get to the next topic. It's uh, benefits of Kubeflow. Uh, so the main benefits of Kubeflow is that um, it is customizable and extensible. So basically, you can use it at, as it is, or you can extend it to include your own tools and workflows. This basically makes it ideal for organizations from all the sizes, small startups to large enterprises. Uh, another benefit is that it provides a unified platform for all the stages of machine learning process. It includes data preparation, model training, model serving, and uh, monitoring. This makes it easier to keep track of your work and understand the impact of your models. Um, Kubeflow also depends on other several open source projects such as Istio. What Istio is, it's basically a service mesh uh, tool which provides networking security features for microservices. Kubeflow basically uses it for secure communication between components. Uh, in addition to Istio, it has, I, I mean, it also depends on other projects such as TensorFlow, Argo CD, Selden, etc. to provide its machine learning capabilities. These dependencies allow Kubeflow to provide a rich, powerful platform for machine learning. They also demonstrate the power of open source to build cutting edge technology. In conclusion, I would like to say Kubeflow is a very important tool for anyone working in DevOps and machine learning. It provides a consistent environment for machine learning workflows and makes it easier to scale and manage resources. If you haven't already, I encourage you to explore Kubeflow and see how it can help you improve your workflows and achieve better results. Um, here are a few takeaways that you can have. Uh, you learn what AIML is, how Kubernetes increases the productivity of AIML workloads, and introduction to Kubeflow. So before I end this, I would like to ask you if you have any questions, you can ask them in Slack channel down below. And um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Lokman. That was incredible. Great talk, talking about ANML. Next up, we've got Uma. And I couldn't believe when we recorded this that Uma had never given a talk before. I think you all agree that this was absolutely amazing. So let's get hers on here. Digging into operators, all right? Let's go. Hello, everyone. My name is Uma, and today, a very basic, a sort of a 101 discussion about operators 101. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's see what these really, really cool things are all about. So, this is what we're going to be talking about. First, let's talk a little bit about Kubernetes and then a lot about stateful applications, what are their drawbacks. Then we'll get into the discussion about operators, why we need them, how do they work, a few operators, and then 
fun stuff at the end. So Kubernetes, as you all know, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform. So we know that it's played a very, very significant role in modern software development by providing a very standard way to manage containerized applications. So what that means is you just deploy your applications and you have it across different cloud providers and then it will help you with automation, productivity. And if you want to know more about how Kubernetes has helped, I have some stuff at the end for you. So since we're here to talk about operators, let's talk a little bit about stateful applications. So the thing with stateful applications is that they store data. So once you log in, you use it, they store the data from that session. And once you log in another time, they use that data to well improve your experience. So we have a Kubernetes cluster here, which is your app and your database. And whatever you do, all the data is stored in your database. So now the thing with stateful applications is that they require a lot of handholding. What that means is, let's say you create an app, you call it MySQL. And now you want different uh, replicas of your app. So when that happens, you create different replicas, but the thing is, they're not all the same. They have their different identities. They have different orders. So let's say, um, I don't know, you want to delete this second replica. It's a lot complicated than you actually think it is because you have to take into account its order. You have to take into account what name it is, what identity it has. It's quite complicated. And let's face it, complication means it usually requires manual intervention. That kind of goes against the idea of Kubernetes since Kubernetes is all about automation and no need of manual intervention. So what happens if they fail? Like, do you have to manually go in? Do you have to do it? And that's why we have operators. So in very, very, very simple terms, operators manage all those complex applications that we just wanted to resolve, right? They're kind of like an autopilot for your system, OK? So why do we need operators? Let's keep using that autopilot analogy, right? Let's say you have a huge flight. And you require an autopilot system to maintain that, to maintain your crew, you maintain your flight systems. I mean, you can't always depend on humans to run such huge complex systems. Sometimes you might not have the manpower that you need on hand. So just as an autopilot for such a huge flight system, you need Kubernetes operators to, to well switch from a manual to an automated mode. So how do these operators work? They actually work by extending the Kubernetes API, right? So let's go back to the applications that we are thinking. Let's say it's now called MyDB, right? What if something fails? Like what if your pod dies right here? Well, you can expect to rely on your operator to help revive this pod. Let's say you make some changes to your pod, some programming changes. Well, how do you expect to deploy them? Operators? here for your rescue. Let's say you make a different version. Now, how do you switch from your existing version to your previous, to your new version? Again, operators are here to help you with that. So, right, this is my favorite part. It's the memes. They always help. So let's look at a few operators here, right? Since we are data on Kubernetes community, let's look at some operators which kind of help you with that. So Prometheus, the Prometheus operator right here. See, when you think you're an obscure movie reference, but Tegro is a movie fan. So Prometheus is actually an open source monitoring system that's widely known and also widely used in the Kubernetes system for monitoring the health and performance of its applications. Same goes to Cassandra. So if you don't know the Greek mythology, I suggest you go check it out when you signal doom, but humans just don't get ya. So, Again, the Cassandra operator also makes it very simple to manage Cassandra clusters and the SIG operator. So SIG actually stands for Special Interest Group and it's actually dedicated to maintaining the operative framework within Kubernetes. 
those are just some very very few operators for you let me tell you one of my favorite operators is the chaos monkey <laughs> so yes let's do a very quick recap operators are special entities they help you in automating very very complex systems and also help in maintaining them they perform various tasks and they also provide a lot of benefits like increased efficiency fewer errors and better scalability now if you're looking for further resources and you're further interested about what operators are how they work please 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 check these resources out the dok community is super super helpful trust me they're really really helpful i mean i got a lot of my doubts solved and yes go to cncf go to operator hub you'll know you'll get to know a lot about them so yes here are a here are a few questions that you might want to ponder on stateful versus stateless apps what other purposes do operators serve and can you make your own operator these are my socials feel free to reach out if you have any kind of questions i'd be more than happy to help even if you have suggestions please feel free to reach out that was my basic one on one on operators thank you so much for listening i think we can all agree that was absolutely amazing and Uma did such a good job, right? It was really, really good, very natural, excellent delivery. So next up in terms of talks, all right, we've got, all right, I uh, want to make sure I'm in the right place. Let's see. And about data streaming. So let's crank it up. Keep those comments flowing in the chat. Cool. Hi. Today we're going to talk about data streaming on Kubernetes. Topics that we will be looking at. How Kubernetes are helpful, what are data streaming tools are in the current market. What does DOK reports of 22 says? What uh, and how data streaming can be useful and helpful in the future industries. Coming to data streaming. Firstly, we should understand what data we are talking about and where this data is being used for streaming. Data that we're talking about is of any form, as you can say, videos, audios, text, documents, images, or any format of data. So we understood what data we're talking about. So let's get to what's streaming and how it is helping in multiple industries. So the data we see in most of the social media platforms are almost in every format. If that's the case, the data we need to make available in real time for that Kubernetes helps in, as it is well-known orchestration tool in industry, which helps to run microservices based applications smooth and function very efficiently. Streaming data applications, which are very, which are well known in the industries examples are twitter youtube linkedin netflix trade market applications and many other kubernetes used in data streaming as organizations use kubernetes firstly they use the databases and analytics and then uses for streaming or messaging data on Kubernetes, there are many benefits of running data on Kubernetes. Scalability, management of workloads, maintenance, security, deployment, and many other. Moving on, Kubernetes to streamline the IT operations. It helps in ensure consistency, revenue growth, enabling developers to self-manage and more benefits. You can check it out in DOK reports 2022. Data streaming tools. These tools helps data to stream very smooth and efficient and make things automate to run without any fluctuations in between the data streams. Following tools are Apache Flink, Apache Kafka, Apache Storm, Red Panda, Stream SQL, Spark Streaming, and many more. Talking about tools, Apache Kafka has established itself on the market with many trusted companies. 
data and logs involved in today's complex systems must be processed reprocessed analyzed and handled often in real time and that's why apache kafka is playing a significant role in the message streaming landscape the key design principle of kafka were formed based on the growing need for high throughput architecture that are easily scalable and provide the ability to store process and reprocess streaming data use cases of these tools real time trades which need to be very accurate when using trading applications location of data user activity e sports security information monitoring and reporting moving on in the end of the discussion we can say its future is very appealing and streaming will continue to mature in many industrial industries of all sizes and helps to run their businesses very smooth ending this and thank you for having me here to talk about this particular topic if you have any questions regarding streaming please join in the slack channel called streaming in dok community and don't forget to check out the dok reports of 22 thank you again have a good day excellent job mohammed very well done very well explained um as he mentioned as well we have a slack channel specifically focused on streaming so if you want to get involved there it's quite easy just jump in and let you, we'll let folks know what you're working on the questions that you might have now next up Right. So I want to make sure I'm in the right place. Going to be talking about uh, going to be talking auto scaling. All right, very very important aspect of Kubernetes. So let's get over there. So how to effectively manage the fluctuating availability and cost effective? How auto scaling helps us? So my name is Atte Tomar, and I am an open source enthusiast. And currently, I am exploring more about Kubernetes, how it works, what is its architecture. So our agenda for today is: what is machine learning? We will look into the Kubernetes. What is the need of auto scaling? What is auto scaling? How does it work? And some of its limitations. Now, what is machine learning? Basically, think of it as like machine learning is allows computer to learn from data without any explicit programming. machine learning makes decisions by identifying patterns and become better day by day imagine like you have an online retail store and you want to optimize your sales by providing personal recommendations to your customers so what you can do you can use machine learning to analyze customers browsing and their purchase history to to make sure they get the products in which they are interested imagine it like in your daily life you are you eat an apple to stay healthy now before eating an apple what you do you wash it you peel it off you slice it here also we need to clean our data before feeding it to the machine learning model so we clean it we uh, clean, we have raw data we clean it we pre process it till uh, we optimize it till it satisfies our need before feeding it to the machine learning model now where there are many, various machine learning algorithms like linear regression logistic regression knn and many more after feeding it to our model we train our model and after that we test our model basically we generally we keep around 70% data we keep for training and 30% for testing you can also do 80 20 now let's suppose after training and testing if it satisfies your accuracy now let's suppose you need accuracy of 90% but your accuracy comes out to be 80% so what you can do you need to tune your uh, machine learning model more you need to optimize it more and ag again you need to train it again you need to test it you need to do it repetitively till it satisfies your accuracy once it satisfies your accuracy you can deploy that model on some uh, deployable platforms like heroku or any cloud platform moving on now what is kubernetes basically kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform it it is used to manage containers at scale it is it manages how they run where they run it was basically developed by google in 2014 and donated to cncf it has self healing capabilities self healing capabilities means if you say i need three copies of my of my replicas then three copies will be there it is also used for auto scaling 
we will see uh, in, uh, we will see how auto scaling works now let's look into the architecture of kubernetes so here we here we have control plane worker nodes basically control plane is used to manage the states of the cluster and worker nodes runs the containers applications in a pod now once a request comes to api server some request comes to api server now api server acts as the brain of kubernetes every component talks to api server so it acts as a brain of kubernetes now once request comes to api server it does three things authorization authentication and admission once the request satisfies these three condition the task of api server is done now scheduler will see which is the best possible node to run a pod it will allocate that okay now let's come to kubelet first now kubelet will say api server do you have anything for me to run it will talk to api server right like, do you have anything for me to run he uh, this kubelet will also talk to api server like do you have anything for me to run then api server will tell yes you need to run a you need to run a pod then kubelet will before kubelet api server will also save it to the etcd log like, like only api server will talk to etcd and all other components will talk to api server okay so etcd is just like api server and other components retrieve and store information about the cluster in etcd so after that kubelet will uh, pass the request to the container runtime now what container runtime will does container runtime will start the containers inside a pod so basically pods pods are the smallest deployable units and kits which host one or more containers within them okay now what kube proxy is basically kube proxy is responsible for routing routing the traffic evenly across pods and across uh, the clusters also now what is ccm cloud control manager basically cloud control manager is responsible for talking to the cloud and kids to perform some actions and what control manager does controller manager controller manager is useful for uh, managing the uh, for responsible for controllers that manages the state of cluster basically for example replica set controller it is useful for creating replicas okay moving on now what is the need of auto scaling basically so let's suppose you create a killer product that has a huge amount of traffic within for that product everyone is dying to buy that product you had a lot of traffic now you can't handle that by manual scale you need to auto scale it it is based on certain metrics like cpu memory queries per second if your cpu is more memory is more than you can't handle the large amount of traffic for your application now what is auto scaling basically it work well, it is automate it does automatically adjust the capacity based on the customer demands like if customer wants more resources it will scale up if customer does not want more resources it will scale down and it works like that kubernetes automatically scale up or down here we can see there are three types of auto scaler horizontal pod auto scaler vertical pod auto scaler cluster auto scaler in horizontal pod auto scaler the number of pods increases in vertical pod auto scaler the resources inside a particular pod increase and in cluster auto scaler we increase the number of pods as there are no pods within them we, in, we are increasing the number of pods similarly we can scale down also in scaling down the pods will decrease in vertical pod auto scaler the number of resources will decrease and in cluster auto scaler the number of nodes will be decreased moving on some of the limitations of auto scaling are if you are not having enough resources you will not be able to handle your workloads and if predictions are inaccurate obviously automatically auto scaling will not be able to adjust capacity according to now some of the key takeaways from this session are you have learned about machine learning and intro to architecture of kubernetes and how auto scaling helps organizations in scaling up by using horizontal pod vertical pod and cluster auto scale so for thank you everyone for listening to this session and for further discussion you can join ai ml channel on our dok slack channel and i recommend you to check out the statistics indicated in the dok 2022 research report all right excellent job aditya that was very very good now we're going to keep it going with some talks about more related to career advice of folks that are at different points in their careers and we will start out with sankita all right
Holiday Native Journey, and I want to hear about it more. So, Sankita, give us a little bit of your backstory and and get us up to up to speed about what you're doing right now. Finally, an undergraduate at the National Institute of Technology, Bergopur. I am uh, currently, you know, doing computer science, but then also learning a lot amount of cloud. For myself, I have got some uh, some certifications from AWS and Azure, and I'm planning to get some more recently. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much about me. I also sometimes, you know, just bake cookies and sometimes do some traveling. So yeah, that's, that's good. That's, that's good coding. Yeah. Awesome. And can you can you tell me more about the certification? Uh, how did you decide which certifications you were going to take? What was the process like? What were what are some things for for people that if they want to get the certifications, they should keep in mind? Sure. So uh, about AWS, they have a very specific and well defined path. If you go through their AWS Skill Builder site, maybe I could just link the comment down below, and you can just go there and uh, go through all the uh, you know paths that they have. One for the developer, you can go for the security, you can even go for the DevOps. Okay, so suiting to your role, they have certification levels. You can just go and grab them. Um, for for women specifically, they do roll out certain um, you know special programs. For example, AWS uh, She Builds Cloud Up. Um, they do give you certain um, voucher codes where you can get maybe fifty percent off okay. if you attend their training. So it's going on right now, guys. I just I'll just link the same for here. Hmm. So yeah, you can go grab them for for women especially. It, it, it's 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 uh, important to you know uh, get into these programs because they hold regular classes and uh, they'll help you solve your doubts if you have any. And I would say practice, network, and uh, you know, develop your interest and just, just, just be curious. That's it. Yeah, great. With that in mind, um, how did you come into contact with uh, women in cloud native? Yeah. So, uh, Rick Shali and Nancy, I would give uh, I would give them a great shout out because these people are doing some awesome jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so basically, we have started it for women uh, who are looking for maybe uh, like, you know, starting off with cloud or changing into cloud and DevOps, uh, because uh, in India, especially, it becomes a little daunting for high school students to get into cloud directly. Because maybe, I don't know, um, a little bit of lack of knowledge or maybe uh, too much data structures being flowed into their courses or something. But yes, cloud may be a little daunting to start with, but it's equally interesting. And I believe uh, it makes life so much more simple. So yeah, Nancy and um, Rikshali, I just met them over uh, Twitter and uh going through them on uh, through their profiles on LinkedIn. I joined the community and I would definitely recommend all the girls out here to just go and, you know, join the community. We, we even hold chats, we hold coffee site, uh, tea shop, uh, you know, you know, tea talks and all. And we do share a lot about the things, not just uh, cloud, but also something related to how you can, uh, you know, start writing your own blogs, which is very important. And that has helped me um, land all my internships almost that I remember. So, yeah, keeping a track of all that you know is also very important. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's it. Yeah. Fantastic. And in terms of your next steps, um, what are you looking at? Is it more certifications? Do you want to specialize in a particular area? What do you have in mind? Basically, coming this far ahead, uh, that's, that's one point I would like to share with people. You do not get stuck to a particular tech stock, okay? When you're starting off, it's very important. For, for me, especially for the last three years, I've been uh, doing a lot of coding. Sometimes I have also been doing into cloud and security. Okay, I think it's important for you to have a very open mind, especially when you are in tech, okay? And understand what exactly is the field for you. So um, besides besides core programming, I am uh, planning to get into uh, a little bit of security certifications maybe. And then uh, also uh, AWS Solutions Architect Associate. Yes, that's um, next on my radar. So yeah, very much preparing for it. Very, very good. Well, look forward to uh, to seeing your next steps and keep up the amazing work. It's so nice to see not only that you're doing it, but that you're so open about your experience and making that available because it gives other people a chance to see I can do this, you know, that I can, I can take similar steps. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that with us today. And, and like I said, look forward to seeing all the cool things you're doing. 
as you mentioned as well, we'll put uh, the links to the different programs that you mentioned so that other people can participate. All right? Sure. Perfect. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. How can communities help people grow, advance their careers, provide an opportunity to give others support? Joined by Rosaline, very excited to have her with us. Uh, she's connecting from Nigeria, but is also well established in the cloud native community. And in addition, women in cloud native. Rosaline, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, how your journey started, and how you got connected to these cloud native communities? <laughs> Hi, everyone listening. My name is Rosalind, like I've been introduced um, here. So my journey started last year when I graduated from school and um, wanted a transition into tech, build a career in tech. So I, during my research, I came across um, cloud native and DevOps engineering as a path in tech I could transition to. And I'd say I love... Um, love the concepts behind DevOps um, field and I picked the interest in it. So um, from last year to this year, my journey has been going on well. And about community, I came in contact with the women in cloud native community earlier this year when Nancy posted about the launch of the community. So I picked interest because learning alone and as a woman, um, a self-thought um, DevOps engineer, it's, it has not been easy. The journey has not been easy because it's it's kind of rare to see your um, fellow women um, on the same path as, as, as I. So when I saw the community, I felt like it was... Um, it was um, it was um, a place that I I'd, I'd like to connect with other women. That I'm not just connecting with other women. Um, at least a community I can learn together with um, with other women in the community. So that was how I joined the Women in Cloud Native Technology. And having joined the uh, Women in Cloud Native Technology, um, we saw a problem that um, the way people asking how to start their careers in Cloud Native, how to start their careers as a DevOps engineer. So we decided to embark on the 90 days of DevOps joining. Um, sponsored or hosted by the Women in Cloud Native community. That was how that was birthed. And we started that February um, this year, 2023. And the journey has been going on so far. And we've had um, one of our community members um, shared um, what he's learned over the weeks. We join, we hop on calls, um, by weekly calls to share knowledge amongst ourselves. So it has been really, it has been going on well. And for any woman, um, any lady, any woman who is um, making a transition into DevOps, um, DevOps engineering field, I would encourage you to find a community, especially a community of women that you can identify with and join the community because it helps you grow. It, it helps you learn in an ecosystem where you can identify yourself with people that you can relate to it. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic. That was great points there. And in addition to that, I understand that you also do some technical writing. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, technical writing came as a side, um, um, a side thing doing, and most especially because I have um, a background in English. I graduated from, um, from the university. Um, background in English. So I, while learning DevOps, I decided to leverage my skills, um, my writing skills and in some books um, alongside. So that was how technical writing came along. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, Rosalind, thank you so much for joining us today. Looking forward to seeing the new things you'll be doing in Women in Cloud Native and the CNCF more broadly. Best of luck on your journey and look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. To approach the cloud native community, what's the best way to get involved? There are a lot of ways to do so. And I am joined by an amazing person who's very active in the CNCF ecosystem, very active organizing a KCD that she'll probably talk about. And her name is Annalisa. Welcome. How are you doing? Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, pleasure to be here again to talk with you. And thanks for your wonderful presentation, <laughs> introduction. Well, um, 
you invited me over because uh, we are going to talk to students and rookies and wannabe contributors and whoever wants to approach the community of the CNCF or open source uh, as, as wide. Um, I'm really new uh, to this industry, as I said many other times. I spent 20 year long in another industry. Um, I didn't know what the CNCF was. I didn't know uh, what community was. So I'm um, here just to tell about me and maybe to give some pieces of advice. They may be useful for someone who, like me, is a non-technical person and is completely new to this environment. But first of all, um, I would say don't fear, don't let fear block you. Uh, it's stupid, it's trivial, banal, but it's like that. Don't don't fear other people, don't fear the community, um, and don't think you don't fit into the environment because you are too old, too young, you don't have, you don't have a PhD, uh, whatever may the reason be. Uh, if you really wish to be part of the community, just go ahead. Um, somewhere else, I stated. Um, uh, jump into the community, do it, just do it. I confirm that, but I wish to give uh, some more advice, if I may. Uh, do not rush into things and into people. Don't be restless. Um, I would say pause, listen first, read, try to watch how other people behave, what they're doing, take part in meetings and get prepared beforehand. Um, I'm saying that because it happened. I, I happened to hear people approaching a given working group and introducing themselves saying, hello guys, hello um, uh, everyone. Uh, I want to help, I'm here to help, but I don't know what you're doing here. I don't know what your working group is about. Uh, so probably this is not the best way to join uh, a working group. Um, even for the basic um, reason, um, to respect other people's time and efforts. So first, um, um, it, it doesn't mean you cannot ask for explanations or clarifications, but before joining a new group, dive deep into what's existing, read documents, available documents, go through the repos, uh, try to understand what objectives a certain team has and what has to be done up to that moment. So just get prepared a, bit, a little bit before. And uh, what happened to me? Uh, as I said, I'm not a developer. Uh, so I was told, go and try to learn to get into the CNCF somehow. <laughs> and I tried to find um, a place, a way to be there. Uh, I tried to find something that resonated with me. And the first step I took was to join the marketing committee just because I'm a marketer. And from that point, I um, got to know the business value subcommittee. Um, and they were talking about, at the time, they were talking about the launch of the glossary project. So that was a way that, was, um, that seemed to be uh, good for me to begin with. So I could translate. Uh, into Italian, uh, the glossary terms from English, and in the meanwhile, drive knowledge, because I was studying, so working uh, on the glossary was driving value for me as well. So it was a sort of win-win situation. Then, in the meanwhile, another colleague invited me over to the Cartographers group, who has been developing a um, cloud-native maturity model. And there, it was a bit weird for me, because it was much more technical than the glossary, I found a way to help, writing articles for the blog post, volunteering at a KubeCon booth, um, and somehow sharing my perspective on some of the aspects building the model. Um, so I've been taking baby steps, and that's what I uh, feel I could uh, uh, advise new people. And I'm studying a lot. Studying a lot is the basis uh, of our job uh, as a contributor for the CNCF uh, community. For example, I was gifted a voucher for the KCNI certification, and I didn't want to waste it. But it was very technical for me, very difficult to approach. I studied. I failed <laughs> because I scored 71%, and the minimum to pass is 75%. 
But who cares? I began to pile up knowledge, uh, technical knowledge as a non-technical person. So um, this is something that I, I think it's, um, it, it's suitable for many people like me. Um, another way is um, to help organizing meetups or local events. For example, I'm in the KCD Italy co-organizing team and that's another way. If you're a marketer, you can give advice. You can, you can help with uh, supporting with the graphics, with the social media, um, uh, with a number of promotional activities and organizing physically the events as well. Finding the location, the venue, trying to set up the agenda and so on. So that was my, that has been my experience up to now. And hopefully it will grow a bit. I will be at the KubeCon uh, in a panel, um, I will take part to a panel organized by Mark Jarvis uh, about the KCDers. So, what KCDers um, can share with the rest of the community. So, in honor. And that's it. <laughs> that's very now. good. Very, very good. For now. For a couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, this, this has been the last couple of years. And a lot's happened, and it's obvious a that a lot, a lot will continue to happen. And I think yeah. your insights are are ones that that we that we see shared and need to be shared more, so that people don't feel like it's a competition and know those best practices of how to get involved, how to have meaningful, sustainable contributions. I think it's I think it's great advice. Cool. Good. All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, and always Hi, a pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see you in KubeCon. Yes, of course. See you. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll see if I can do this. Yo, Ansible, Active Directory, Directory Auto Scaling, Anchoring Affinity, OBI Group, so amazing. Borg, blankets are like freaking faces on the B side. Bare metal, bacon back to block with the knees. Like cluster school, running controllers, containers, runs at control play. Exposing API as my CSI. Dock it downstream, daemon set on this deployment. Device plug in, here's Rucker for your enjoyment. Femoral, XCD extension sites on the endpoint. And price, like I was making Bitcoin. Final flex in, feature fail, over your fancy. Flex while you play, when you're only making me anti. Garbage getting gobbled, go link. Gifting gateway, generous, granular grades on my gameplay. Helm chart, handling hella tools, hypervisor, HBA, habitual, missing in the cipher, images, ingress, integration, I'm in it. Istio, initiated, IDA, I win it. Jagged Jenkins, Java, Jason, and the Argonauts, Jargon, Bargain, Genesis, and Redis, it's where we're caught from that. Could cut a link, can it? Push it, box seat, kind of sticking KVM, as well as rocks me. Labels, that's a word you call a limit, range, latency. Listen, lugs, they will fucking go, you want to take me. Manifest, member, a mini cube, bottom neck. Maintain, third service, you know, I'm on the, on the map. Name, space, network, nodes, net, space. Natural language, network, policy, paste, object, storage, on print, oscillators, along the really of the orchestra. Peas in a pop, penny to a priority. Proxy be that epoxy, go and check in my authority. QS, short and cold, big query 12. Crack and quark, quandary straight through the hill. Our back runs with a cut set, checking. Replication control of runtime was wrecking. Serverless storage, state full set. Sig static cloud where all my secrets kept. Toleration typos all up in the tape. Yo, Thanos crashing things, files all up in the paint. UID upstream with the skills. User namespace caught up in the hills. Volume claim by Visha Victory is my victor's hypervisor. You're the vivid and sublime. Yo, plug your G. Workload, no for days. While the wind walls up, inspire wacky ways. Xeno, Xerox, Xeno, foes be gone. You know, X, Jink, and Xeno, you know, you bring it home. So, Yamel, Yangling, Y, grab from my past. Yang, Yang, Ging, McCullin up my glass. Zip, zap, zinging, yo, it's Linux on Z. Azure, GCP, EKS brings the G, okay, to me. Yo, we're gonna keep it going. You wanna keep it going? We can keep going. A little bit faster, a little bit faster. Yo, now we're gonna get real old school. Kurt Cobain, William Moss, Cold Train, from Nirvana to Nirvana, Commander's works full game, locked and loaded, native, policy, frolicking, mode ahead, send me, let me, have me, wallop, be a frolicking, cool control, 
refuse the old You know you're cruising for a bruise And if your cage games fall on the pipes Wesley's eyes can snipe Put your CI to your CD Time to shine your strike So you can get some plasma Or rhyme get jam-packed Cut your breath like asthma Roll go slack But come on, come on, let me Castillo De Jorecos in Alaska I will mask these thoughts for Alaska Call me Casper Cause we're no He's talking many more Than my boy Louis The root on the BBC One, two It's a D.O.K. community And you know this how we do Boys Call Hendrix, like Hendrix, you know, there's some that might call me Jimmy. But when the rage gets out the cage, I go run for the gauge because it's time to meet Jimmy. It's a battle royale, and we got Goliath on David. If it's actually not crave it, is a temporary, I save it. We're talking about Argo nuts being tight, oh, oh, so tight with that airflow. And that ain't no scarecrow sitting with your fried rice eating that night. He's a full stack man with a full stash plan. Data ops, the biggest cops, stop your fin out scam from the southern part of Holland. He makes his own beat, so get in slack and ask him some questions if it's knowledge you seek. Tim Vanekir, I'm gonna keep dancing because this is gonna be awesome. We got a battle royale, Argo versus Airflow. Who's gonna be the winner? Check it out, it's gonna rock! Do we do work? D O K community. <clears throat> Sometimes we need a break to farm our way. Okay. <laughs> Bye. 
I break to find for my way when Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yo, it's Alex with no malice, gripping and sipping and on the chalice, sitting in the palace, wonderland like Alice and he gallops at paces with greatness, make shift creative, and never complacent, not sitting with no patience, chasing, misplaced monoliths, retrace, to all forgotten addicts, you know we're starting static, cause it's a workload, critical mission, reposition your addition, adds up to buckets and blobs, easily scalable, clean pops. Duckets. We struck in the cluster. Keep the to Come in the duster. My folks in my ego. Nearest of San Diego. Keep it close to Lego. My ego. My ego. Lego. My ego. And give it back to Alex Gallego. You know he's rocking it. He's rocking that red panda. He's rocking that data streaming. Real time. Real time. Modern data streaming. Batch. Real time. We got everything. Check it out. We got bars. You know I got my thumbs to bring down with these nuns up in your with brain deep with my lungs up. You know I got my thumbs to bring down with these nuns up in your picking all my runs up. Bring these dump trucks down to London. Got my stun gun, you know I'm a singer and one of my somewhat. You know I got in the D, okay, with lots of talk. All these people overseas and trying to top me up. We got that tricky Nikki taking the Mickey. No seeds and stems, you know it's always sticky. Third box to bring your machine to the workshop. Dominique, top the rocks in you're bringing your socks up. Bringing the first, not the worst. The best is a test, and you did with the rest. You know, we got a panel trying to bring it on your channel. We got Allison and Chalice and bring Lorraine to the house of pain. We're taking it to the community, diplomatic community, facing all the unity. T.O.K., February 16th. You know, you got to be there if you want to be seen. You want to be seen. You definitely want to be seen. It's the first T.O.K. meetup that we're doing overseas. We're taking it local, and we're getting real, real serious. Get ready to watch the Big Ben rock it. It's going to be knocking. It's going to be amazing. We're gonna 21, that's prime time. 94 with a touchdown. That's two numbers. Make your crew wonder how the heck did I get stuck now? It's like this is impacting. I'm seeing Jack and Data recovery. Comp and Sherman's got you squirming like Steve Irwin on Discovery. Rest in peace. My envoy sends Rob Roy and Ewan McGregor, not Undertakers. Habib's knees, please better believe that my oats still mill like Quakers. State, because we got three wise dudes in three countries that are spitting on the mic. Never thought I'd be doing something. A tricky, tricky tempo, no bars, let go. Trying to get more clients like my name was Brad Renfro. Push, push like it's full recess. Data on Kubernetes community makes your skull keep fresh. Happy with meals, feels one to sit and sit and go to shock meal. What's the deal? Snappy, happy with meals, feels one to sit and sit and go to shock it with eels. Persistent dish, no risk on these stateful steps. Debate restates, have the power, a graceful step. Can you predict? Pod, start and stop, host name, price is right, Bob Barker. Christmas past is a ghost name, so give me that PTC, not that PCP. P O G R W O. Now it's time to read and write your own R W S and play the card to trouble you flex. NFS test with the best story from the east to the west. Court straight. Filters, portainer from the rest. Neil Cresswell killing it on that staple set. Hot scotch, don't botch cakes. Bullets grazing, frat hazing ain't amazing. It stops grace. Gosh, sound, I don't drop plates, a rock slate. Logo is an amazing octopus named Tracy. Back at the back, Tortugas need to call me Jones, that's Casey. 
Casey, helping you make those open source ducats for your S3 or your GCS buckets. Struck it out the park like my name was Kirby Puckett. And you bet I'm nerdy, hurting peeps to so bring the ruckus, bring the ruckus. Sebastian, no stranger to containers. We a ranger, a sudden danger, leading the wise men to the manger. Shack this caddy, Rod is in the field, in the field, in the field of a danger. Ostrace. Yo, flip zap, don't hit that, don't change down my channel Cause I'm zipping up my flannel and it's time to hit the panel Discussion giving haters concussions, I'm moving passengers quick You know my failures and the blunder cause I'm busting You think it's all about tech, you know that, that you're falling The industry will be calling, check your worth first like Colin While my data straight and balling, even lucky 7-2 bright The lion Misha's racking the stats, we bring this iron to lion Iron Design and 7 to 11 to our main man, Evan Powell. Bring it. Ramiro Berriese like Bobby De Niro is making that dinero. You know he's rolling a Tesla rain like Minero. Looking for the crypto and bumping a crypto. Rolling Frisco to a hipto. Pero cruzamos a la frontera y nos encontramos con un chingón. The reason we're translating bites into Spanish. And this meaning with the poesy of flu, you know, in tonos digitales. CND go for Sidney Lopez. Or was it Lopper? From what did you call the proper? Call the little lighthouse. Did you get the burrito de lengua? Desire to make the case. The development, environment, ceasefire, se llama una tregua. Yo, I'm part in Dali, it's called me Salvador. Feliz es que provoca un escándalo. Like Rafael, con Avangelo. I'm a vandal, so, and I'm ample in my answer. In 2021, empezamos la revolución de Kubernetes, o como se diga. A sleek rider like Street Fighter, Dick Dial, mixed Ryu, mixed with Sunny Chiba. Date on Kubernetes, Ranimiro Berriesa. Octeto is a company, check it out. A verbal. You can call us Robin Hood, cause we're taking down that sheriff about to get in troll. Two store with my main cool and all and my main man Eric. Cover call error is a sign. Because we bring persistence to the game. These speakers go up to eleven loud and clear. You're the world with the volume claim. So keep the questions flowing like the Nile, the Tigris, and the River. The game just make a war round down. Like we're clearing out the Oscar, then move on to the Grammy. Stay full and grateful with the most perfect of styles. Don't get overwhelmed at the helm when you're rolling, when you're rolling with them gamble fouls, with them gamble fouls. You're the right use and dials, the sonic with my Hadouken. You know, as a 90s boy, so I'll cut my teeth on the Duke new Kim. Your persistence is persistent. Then giving up just won't happen. Already getting requests for part two. Just when my toes, they got to tap it. Getting to tap it. My toes are tapping. The rhythms are snapping. We got to get part two. With my main man, Eric Zito, killing it on the storage, killing on the persistent volume claims. And Kunal, could you have a better explanation of stable versus stateless? If you didn't check out the video, you better go watch that right now. Much like from Jade on Kubernetes, you bars. That's a low. See ya. That's a low in Hungarian. Wouldn't wanna be. I'm a shark in your aquarium. Yo, it's Adam on the if You know I won't grieve. I mix up message. Rob Bob, then I'll weave. The styro will inspire. So bring with the facts like pulp fiction. My fiction mixing jewels up in my raps. I'll strike down. With that furious anger, when you're in danger, get bit by White Fang. Like he's got more operators than the ER on Call of Duty. Self service provisioning from Budapest to Djibouti. Adam Sandor. Like Spud, catching the air like Bud. Cuban costs like Rick Ross, make you cry like a thug. Kate rules everything around me. Cream, making these green backs. I'm taking these lean stacks from haters, making scheme facts, make you go bankrupt. Faster than a wheel of fortune. Pat Sajak in the box, dishing up your meal and portions. Web's been added with Borg like with Craig, like it's a Friday thing. What started as a dashboard in Grafana. Now bites with a piranha swim. A confessional and conventional pedestal. A fire brimstone on 24. That spree wells the trail shop until you drop in pop lock and makes case running like DMC. Now you can breathe well. Achieve mail, you got it. Saving Ryan's megabyte the dot. These dead press like stacked up the feds. Godfather part one. Time to hit the map. We don't need no beds. Build or buy. No, it's build, it's fly. But don't take a pill that's filled with unskilled finances. That's my stance on high trance. My friends with a wide lance on stack watch. Get your sask watch. Give him back talk. It's a sayers call. John Mayer's ball. Cast out your cow cast. Cause this is the player's ball. We got Web Brown, Stack Watch, creators of KubeCons, amazing company. Much love. Jade on Kubernetes. Peace.